first what I'll get you to do, Carlos, is if you can just um, look at the camera and just say, hi, my name's Carlos, and this is my story so far. Hi, my name's Carlos, and this is my story so far. My life um, started in 1986 and uh, I was born in um, the city of Medellin in uh, Colombia, South America. Born to mum and dad, uh, unfortunately my dad passed away very early on in my life. Uh, I was only eight months old, so 1987, um, meaning I never really got to know my dad. So, so met mum, was left a widow, uh, very young. She would have been 17 at the time. Uh, now, um, the reason my dad died was uh, he was actually murdered, uh, just due to his involvement um, in, um, in a life of crime. Um, yeah, so my dad, my dad was a hitman. Uh, I know that sounds a little bit um, like out of a movie or whatever, but, uh, that, that, that was the reality of, um, of my family. My dad was a hitman and he was, he was involved in uh, just all the drug and, um, and all the drug violence uh, during the 80s uh, in Medellin due to the cartels. My mum was still getting involved with some of the people in, in that similar type of life as my dad. Um, so, you know, first five, seven years of my life uh, included sometimes uh, me being at uh, discotheques back then, that's what it would have been called, um, uh, late at night with mum, uh, uh, witnessing, uh, you know, at uh, uh, block parties in Medellin, you know, uh, even gang violence, cartel violence. Um, my greatest desire was always uh, to, to have a dad. You know, I remember so many times I bury my head in a pillow and uh, just really uh, cry out and go, well, um, you know, uh, cry out to God or whatever at that stage and go, why don't I have a dad? You know, I just wish I could see my dad. One afternoon, mum and I were getting a bus home and um, we missed the bus in front of us. And, and this is where I, I think sometimes you just, you just see God's hand in, in retrospect because we missed the bus that we were meant to catch. And, um, you know, when we were getting close to home, we got on the bus behind it, but we were passing this other bus. Uh, we noticed that there was a whole bunch of commotion happening there. Um, military police in, in Medellin during that time, you didn't really have normal police. You actually just had military police because of the amount of violence that was uh, going on. So all the police just had, you know, M16s and, and that sort of thing. That is, is the real deal. And so there's a big commotion. This bus was stopped and, um, and uh, obviously we just, we just knew that something wasn't right. Uh, but uh, yeah, later that night, as we drove past that bus, we found out that uh, that, that bus had been uh, raided uh, by some, yeah, by some uh, criminal gang uh, that got on that bus and uh, they demanded everything of everybody and then basically uh, shot dead everyone on that bus. And so, um, you know, I remember that night with mum just thinking, wow, like, that was meant to be us on that bus. And um, it's, yeah, it's just one of those moments of, of wow, this is, this is what we're living in. But one of the things that impacted me the most was who my dad was. And so early on in life, there was only snippets uh, that were revealed to me about who my biological father was. I always had this sense, this inner sense of darkness uh, which was really strange. Uh, I could never uh, really um, determine where that was coming from, uh, but it almost felt like I had inherited uh, this desire for aggression and violence, and um, it's something that I was always conflicted with. Look, 1995 uh, was a pretty big year for me and, and, and mum, and uh, which was, uh, you know, November 1995, we arrived here in Australia. And uh, the, the reason, well, I guess, um, uh, the reason behind that was really my family. Uh, my aunties 
uh, at the time. Um, very proactively, we're, we're thinking around how they could make a difference in, in my life, I guess. Uh, at the time, I couldn't see that, uh, but they could probably foresee what my life was going to look like if I, if I stayed in Colombia. Um, as I began to discover more about the reality of, of who my family was, not just my dad, but my uncles. And, and yeah, so uh, then being able to foresee that, um, they, they got to work and um, so my aunties, my grandma, uh, they, they all chipped in um, to help mum and I come to Australia. The next uh, really big thing that happened in my life was 1997, November again, um, I believe 22nd of November 1997 uh, we're on our way to the beach and um, really hot summer's day you know mid 30s um, we come to a standstill at Narang around Narang um, down near the Gold Coast as we were heading uh, down there and the car behind us didn't get enough time to stop uh, which meant that uh, they, they hit us from behind um, our car actually um, exploded, so the fuel tank exploded uh, due to the heat and the pressure um, in, the, in the petrol tank. And I was sitting right over it. Um, in the car at that time was my little brother who was only 10 months old, uh, my new little brother, uh, born to my stepdad and, um, and my mum. And uh, my stepdad and my mum were in the front. And so what happened is the petrol tank exploded um, Flames came around me, um, around the car, and uh, I just remember being thrown to the front of the car. Uh, it was a really old Renault which had no seat belts at the back, and, uh, and all I was wearing was uh, board shorts because I was just getting ready to go to the beach. So I get thrown into the front of the car, car's on fire, uh, my stepdad's frozen in his seat. And, uh, and I remember actually having to kick him to, for him to wake up so that he could get out and so I could get out. Um, so he, he came to, he opened the door, he jumped out of the car, jumped out. I remember standing on the hot, on the hot bitumen on the highway, uh, just burning, um, but also seeing my mum was still stuck inside the car. Um, and see mum, I don't know how, but um, out of adrenaline, uh, Mum rips her seatbelt off, she turns around and she rips the whole baby seat out of um, the attachments and then um, throws uh, my brother inside the baby um, seat out of the car and uh, some bystanders um, caught him, took him away, Mum got out and then um, all I remember is um, people were coming to us with anything they had, whether, you know, uh, water bottles, cordial, all sorts, anything that was liquid, they were pouring it on us um, to try and um, cool us down. Uh, so I ended up with uh, third degree burns all down the right side of my body. Um, so my leg, my buttocks, all the way up uh, to my side, my arms. Um, had to have both my ears reconstructed. Um, second deg degree burns all across my face. Um, Mum burnt, was also burnt all on her shoulders and her face. Um, my little brother had some on his face, on his arm. And yeah, my stepdad luckily was wearing a leather jacket, jeans, leather shoes and <laughs> hat, uh, which meant he just had a bit of singeing to his ears. Uh, so he was very lucky uh, in that sense. Um, but yeah, what that meant is it was a new struggle. And uh, I was away from school, I was in hospital uh, for a couple of months. And uh, probably the, the, the scariest moment was uh, laying in hospital after the accident with my leg up in the air, suspended up in the air, and uh, hearing the doctors talk about whether they could save my leg or not. Uh, for about two hours, um, they were trying to figure out whether they could save my, my right leg. And um, but yeah, I'm thankful that, uh, that they were able to do that. Yeah, so my awareness of God um, was definitely there uh, from an early age. Uh, being raised in, in a Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic environment. Um, it was just normal in, in Colombia. You, you, everybody was sort of born a Roman Catholic at the time. Uh, but what that meant is uh, my awareness of God was, was a little bit confusing in a sense, um, especially with everything that was happening or had happened in my life. 
I think that um, not having a dad really impacted uh, my my view of God in that I always felt God was far away. Uh, I just couldn't really sense God anywhere near me. I was always taught and told that there was a God, uh, but I could just never sense that God was near me. Um, and I think that had a great deal to do with just not having a dad in my life. Um, and it also had a, an impact upon my view of God in that, well, you know, there's, that, there's just that typical um, thought that we all have sometimes, like if God is good, then why do bad things happen? Um, and I always wondered, well, if, if you love me, why did you take my dad? Um, if, this is, if, if you're real. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was a bit of, uh, I guess, during that season, what, what my awareness of God was like. Um, coming to Australia then again and having some, something happen like the car accident um, then brought me to a, a different, um, different view of God. I almost felt, I went through a season where I almost felt like God must be really angry at me uh, for some reason. Um, and so that led me into, I guess, um, or leads into uh, how I saw him throughout my teens. Um, it just, it was a sense of God's far away from me in my early age. Um, and then I just thought, well, God must be really angry with me. Um, and I began to get quite angry with God. I missed out on a fair bit of school due to my car accident, um, which really set me back. I was already behind because of my language. I never forget grade nine, year English, my first introduction to like, you know, some serious sort of English um, that was more than just, you know, spelling and, and a bit of grammar. Um, I, rem I remember being told that, that I had a, an oral assessment I had to put together. And I remember lining up for that class that day, uh, very early in year nine, um, would have been like the first term. And um, just getting this, at, this at the time I didn't know it was anxiety, but I remember my, my palms getting sweaty. I remember feeling cold. I remember freezing up in that line and um, didn't know what to do. So it was that one of those reactions where it was just um, yeah, um, fight, flight um, reaction. And, and, and I chose flight. So I chose to run, and I remember ducking away down the stairs, going to hide in a bathroom uh, to avoid that class. Um, I skipped the next class and the next class after that, and so it just became a habit um, now uh, where anything which was too hard for me in school, I tried to avoid it. And um, that meant that skipping school uh, began to meet uh, other blokes, or other people that were also skipping school, and um, yeah, it just led me down a track of, of meeting uh, probably not the best company. I think it was the very first week of, of grade 10 and a deputy pulls me in and says, uh, she pulls out my, my track record and uh, she says, look, um, I don't think school's a place for you. And uh, basically that's where my, my formal, I guess my school education uh, sort of ended. Uh, well, I felt it did. Um, as I was asked to go home that, that very moment and I was asked not to return to that school. Mum and I then uh, tried to figure out what I was going to do. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, to get into uh, to Warren College at the time um, as a second chance and I really enjoyed Toowong because it was a much smaller school that had some language support so I was getting a bit of help there and I was starting to enjoy school again. Uh, unfortunately, uh, very quickly, um, I think I was only about six months in and some of the guys that I was hanging out with got into a fight um, and because I was around at the time, um, I was sort of implicated in that and uh, the principal asked me uh, basically so I wouldn't get in trouble. He said very kindly that I should probably not return to the school and uh, once again it was one of those situations where I was, um, yeah, just trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, and at the time I was only, yeah, it would have been about 14 and a, four, around 15. Um, so I spent a bit of time on the street uh, during the days because um, I just didn't really have much else to do, uh, which meant that uh, I met some, some people on the streets and um, that very quickly led into, um, yeah, me being introduced to drugs alcohol, um, that whole uh, scene. 
started drinking quite early, introduced to alcohol very early on. Uh, probably even around 12, I was introduced to alcohol, you know, whether it was through family gatherings, whether it was um, being at a mate's place, smoking, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, when I found myself not in school a great deal, I was introduced to, yeah, introduced to pot. And very quickly, I was introduced to some hard drugs like ice. Um, at 16, uh, you know, I, I made a very clear decision that that if I was going to be a bad boy, uh, I was going to be good at it. And in one night, um, I made made a pretty big mistake in that I uh, got involved into in, in, in a number of altercations in, in one single night where uh, three young men uh, ended up in intensive care, and I was charged with uh, three accounts of grievous bodily harm, number of accounts of uh, deprivation of liberty. Uh, break and enter, uh, you name it. It, it, it was a big, um, yeah, it's quite a few charges there. Uh, I was lucky that I was a, still, a, still a teenager, still a juvenile. Um, I did a few nights in juvie, but when I went back to, um, yeah, when I, went, when I went to court, I was actually surprised uh, that the one person that was there, and then, you know, the judge asked, um, asked that day, um, is there anyone that, that can answer for this, for this young man or can take this young man under their wing? And there was a youth pastor there from my mum's church and uh, he put his hand up and he said, yeah, I'll take him under my wing. And, and I was like, okay, well, what's this guy doing? Has my mum asked him to do this? Uh, a bit confused by that. Um, but it meant that I walked out of that courtroom that day. Around 18, 19 is when I remember um, things really just uh, hitting rock bottom. Um, didn't understand what depression was at the time, didn't understand any of these things, it just, it's just things that I felt. And I found myself living, living a, um, sharing in an apartment um, with a bloke uh, in Fortitude Valley, uh, you know, uh, dealing drugs and all that sort of thing at the time. Um, but yeah, just really into tumps, uh, contemplating almost all the time whether it was better to just take my life you know, one of those moments where I really was ready to do it, uh, out of nowhere I got a phone call um, and I answered my phone and it was, it was an old friend of mine who I hadn't spoken to for a, for a number of years and, and um, she, she got my number, she had my number still and she calls me, she says, whatever you're going to do, don't do it. <laughs> and she just tells me, I've got, I've got this sense to call you and just tell you that whatever it is you're thinking of doing, don't do it. Um, you have something special and she wasn't a Christian or anything um, but I, I definitely know that that had to be God in that moment. Ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome Carlos Gomez to the stage? Thanks mate. Is that all? Thank you guys. Mate, um, that's the second time I've watched that that interview clip and, um, you know, we've only covered really the first sort of 20 years of your life and I think it's safe to say that there's been, there was a lot that happened in those first two decades um, from obviously your, your journey from Colombia to Australia and then car accidents to uh, criminal activity and until you find yourself um, receiving a phone call. I want to pick the story up there because there is, there is so much more to tell. What, what happens, I guess, as you start to head into your young adult years, um, you're, I believe you're still sort of under a, a probation and you're required to uh, attend youth group and, and that sort of thing, but you're skipping out of that. What then happens in your life beyond um, when you receive that phone call? Can you talk us through those events and moments? Yeah, so, um, so I get this phone call from, from a friend, uh, basically saved my life. Um, and uh, next couple of months were really, really full on after that because yeah, it was sort of like this sense of something was chasing me or something was pursuing me and that something was God. Um, and, uh, but it was really hard because I was still, on, you know, still using drugs and still pretty down in the dumps and you know, at the time I was being followed by police for <laughs> different things and uh, so there's a yeah, lots of anxiety, uh, depression, um, but yeah. So what happened is, not long after that, I, um, I was driving, 
driving a car through Mount Gravatt and I uh, got pulled up in the middle of the day. Um, yeah, probably looked a little bit different back then. Um, had a shaved head. I think I was driving my car without a shirt. Um, it was a summer day or something like that. And, um, and I was in the car with, with someone and had a bag full of money. And the back of the car, I had some stuff that I shouldn't have had in the back of the car. Uh, but the police pulled me up. And um, basically, I ended up getting arrested um, by some miracle. I didn't end up locked up that day. But not long after that, I got pulled up again uh, down at the Gold Coast and um, got in trouble again. Um, didn't end up locked up that time because I had money to pay for lawyers and that sort of thing. But, um, and this is all within a few months. But basically, six how months old, after... How old were you when this was happening? It was all around 18, yep. 19. Yep. And, um, for about six months after that, um, I finally called my mum when things really just were so low, I didn't know what to do. I hadn't spoken to mum in, like, forever. Um, it was a really humbling experience to have to call mum and say, I need help. I don't know what to do. Um, I want out, but I just don't know what to do. And uh, one night, mum just came and picked me up where I was living in the valley and um, we went for a drive. And I just remember pouring out my heart and just apologising and um, just telling my mum everything that I've been up to, which was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but she just listened and she was like, wow, like, that's full on. And, um, but she just said to me, son, you've always got a place with me at home. And I didn't really want to go back home because my stepdad was still there and I never really got along with him and all that. But, um, but things got to that place where I just ended up having to go back home. Like everything fell apart. Um, those people who I thought were my friends um, were now wanting to... I guess, harm me and what, whatever uh, for different reasons. Um, I was in big trouble with the police, so they were always watching me. Um, money dried up, um, and I just felt like rubbish. And, um, so, but I, anyway, so I ended up moving back home to mum's place. And throughout that time, I was still, still using drugs. So, you know, things didn't change dramatically. Um, and uh, one morning, um, I think it was a Sunday morning, um, mum gets a really hard knock on the door and uh, next minute I'm waking up and there's like three or four coppers at, at my bedside. I look up and <laughs> there's three cops looking at me and they're like, hey mate, you've got to come with us. And um, at that time I didn't even know what it was for because there was just so many things that, that were pending in court or whatever, and um, they just said, yeah, look, you, you breach uh, bail conditions or whatever, and so I ended up in lockup for a few nights. Uh, but really, the charges that I was facing at that time, uh, what it led to was potentially um, four years in prison. Um, and uh, I remember spending the, the weekend in the watch house and then coming up to magistrate's court, um, absolute mess. Uh, I'd been using drugs, you know, without telling mum and that sort of thing and uh, really spun out. Was, uh, the, was the drug use an escape from your reality? Yeah, look, um, you can call it an escape. Um, or to numb the pain? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't put a finger on that. You know, a lot of people say that, that they do things to escape. Um, I think at that stage, yeah, it was, it was some of that. Um, but it, it, it was really just a mask, yeah. I would say. You know, for me, it was a mask. It was just adding a layer uh, to myself, sort of lying to myself that yeah. everything is okay. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I guess it helped me in sort of thinking that 
I could make it through another day, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you're facing four years in prison and you're heading to court. What happens next? Yeah, quite bizarre. So I um, go up to the courtroom um, and um, I look to my left-hand side. There's no one else there. There's a duty lawyer. There's a magistrate. And um, there's this youth pastor again that I mentioned in the story. And <laughs> he was in the courtroom. What was his name? Um, Estevan. So at the time he was a youth pastor. He's now a pastor. Uh, runs his own church with his family down in Brisbane. Uh, but there he was again. This youth pastor was there again. And uh, that was the moment where I think God finally got through to me. And uh, I just got this sense. It just sort of pierced through my heart. When I saw him in that courtroom, I knew that God had actually been journeying with me all along. And, um, yeah, it was... It was an amazing feeling because at that moment, it was one of those, like the first moment I didn't even care what would happen next. I just knew God was actually with me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What happens with the court proceedings? Yeah, so believe it or not, same thing happened again, like a few years before, like I mentioned in the story, and um, the judge asked if, you know, anyone would answer for me. As an adult, um, I think it's quite unheard of. Um, for a magistrate to even bother, um, especially with what I was facing and already trying to evade the, um, the law for, for, for some time. Uh, but the judge asked if there was anyone that would sort of take me under their wing. And uh, this youth pastor put his hand up again, uh, even though I had thrown it in his face and in times past and sort of let him down and yep. that sort of thing. And, yep. uh, yeah. <laughs> what is your current profession right now, Carlos? I think people would be interested to know. <sighs> yeah, so um, I work for Scripture Union, and um, I'm blessed enough to actually have my boss here, Phil, uh, with me. And um, yeah, so we work with young people in, um, in different settings, whether it's camps, schools, mainly in Queensland we'd be known for school chaplaincy. And I was a school chaplain for, uh, yeah, for a number of years. Uh, before stepping into the role that I do now, which is look after our chappies in Toowoomba. Do you ever, I mean, do you ever, I guess, look at your life and look back over all the events that have happened and then consider where you are today and think, how is this possible? What the heck? Yeah, big time. Even when I was just sitting there, I found it really hard. Because... Um, it's just overwhelming, like, just to know how faithful God is. I think that's the most overwhelming thing in that, um, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do, where you've been, where you come from, how much you've shut the door on him, he continues to knock. Yeah. And... Um, just the way that he sees you is so different to often the way that you see yourself and um, the way that other people might see you. And so, yeah, it's just, I think every day I'm just overwhelmed by that. Yeah. And it's, for me, I think, looking at your life, there's just such a, there's a humility to how you walk. And, you know, I've only picked up the, the, the pieces and the snippets through the, through the interviews that you've given me, but there's a real humility in how you walk with God's grace now, and it's just it's such a powerful testimony to God's uh, restoration and God's healing, and there's never one that's too far gone. There's never one that's too far out of his reach, and I think that speaks volumes to your story in terms of where you were and in the form of a guy called Estevan, mm. he was always there. Even, even from the very beginning in Colombia, God was always there. His presence was always there and his hand was always upon your life. Mm. And as you say, he just kept knocking and knocking and knocking until that revelation dropped in your heart. He's always been there. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, and I appreciate that. I think that, that humility, as Jesus said, uh, he who is forgiven much loves much. And um, that's really, I guess, where that comes from. Um, and uh, I've learned to, um, throughout the years that, um, yeah, look, you're not always going to, you're never going to be perfect. Uh, <laughs> And you're always going to set the bar here for yourself, but the reality is you're always going to miss the mark. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's the beauty of Jesus is that even when you miss the mark, um, he still looks at you with, uh, with love and uh, grace and, um, and he lifts you up. You know, yeah. scripture says a righteous man falls seven times, seven times he gets up. Yeah. That righteousness is not ours that's right. for as much as we try and hold on to that and our, and our works. Uh, you quickly realise that uh, that righteousness that actually it's his righteousness, righteousness that lifts you up every time. Yeah. And um, yeah, but you can't give up. You know, you you can't give up. Yeah. Um, Just quickly, Carlos, where did you where did you meet your wife, Cecia, who I believe is here today? Yep. There she is. <laughs> where did you meet your wife, and and how did all that happen? And because you have three kids. Yep, three kids. Three. Yep. Where did where did you meet Cecia and how did that all happen? Yeah, so funny enough, I met um, Cess at church, um, and uh, that was at um, really at a like a youth Bible study uh, on Wednesday nights. That's why you go uh, to youth Bible study, kids. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, I just remember admiring so much about her, um, just her, you know, just a girl that um, just had a heart for God and um, just so genuine and I think that's what attracted me to her. Was it, was it hard to unpack your story for her? Get, was, there a, was there any ever shame or embarrassment attached to your past? Yeah, there was plenty and um, actually we sort of started out as friends and Back then, you had MySpace. I don't know if anybody yeah. remembers MySpace. MySpace. <laughs> the OG. The OG of social media. How good was it when you could have your favourite song on your wall? Oh, was, you know? Look at us. You miss those days, right? Yeah, you? mate. Bring it back. But yeah, no, we, we used to just chat on there. And I actually, because she was involved in youth ministry at the time, and I was still trying to get my life together and uh, sort of learning a lot about, about God and that sort of thing. And I would just ask her questions and... She would come back to me with Bible texts, and uh, I think, you know, actually a lot of the Bible texts that I hold dear to and that keep me going are, are the ones that um, Seth shared with me during that time. Yeah, great. Awesome. Man, I'm going to get you to um, pray for some people this morning, if, if that's okay. Um, and what I'd love for you to, to pray for is really that, that understanding that there would be people here perhaps, or even people watching online or in our chapel service that maybe have... I really lost that understanding that God is always there, that God is always present. Maybe, maybe they're not dealing with circumstances that you have dealt with, um, but maybe they're dealing with life where they feel like they have been abandoned, where they feel like God has exited the situation. Mm. I want you to really pray, pray into that, to, to remind them that God is always there, that God is always present in every single season, in every single storm, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how isolated or lonely they feel, God is there. And so if I could have every eye closed and the heads bowed this morning and maybe you're watching online or you're over the road at our chapel service, I'd encourage you to do the same. You know, this morning we've heard an incredible story of God's redemptive power, of God's healing power. We've heard a story where a man has wandered and drifted, yet God's hand has remained steadfast. And what is true for Carlos is true for you today. That God has not left you. That God is right there. Maybe right now you feel so abandoned, feel so lost. No answers. You've hit rock bottom. We're here to remind you today that God is right there in your situation. And so if you're here this morning and you'd love Carlos to pray for you, could you simply pop up your hand? We'll see it and you can put it straight back down. Thank you.
He loves you so much. So much right now in this moment. Is there anyone else just as we look across? Thank you. Awesome. Carlos, can you pray please, mate? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just just want to read this verse to you guys. And uh, if that's you this morning, um, I came across this some years ago and um, I think it's just so beautiful the way that God speaks. Um, But Isaiah 49, uh, verse 15, uh, God's having this discourse with, um, with his children, really. And he says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she, she has born. And God says, yeah, though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, and the, the interesting thing is, that, is that, that he says, see, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And prophetically, I believe that speaks about the nails through the hands of Jesus. And um, what Jesus sees um, through those piercings in his hands, even today, um, is not the pain, but he sees your name. He's got you engraved to the palms of his hands. And so I just hope that you can get a hold of that this morning. No matter how alone you feel, how forgotten you feel, the reality is that um, God is thinking of you and he thought of you on the cross and not just then but now. So Father, I just give you thanks. Give you thanks that your word does not change. I give you thanks that your word doesn't fall without bringing forth fruit. It is a seed that brings forth fruit. Lord, I just pray for everyone who's, um, yeah, opened their heart to you this morning in a special way. And they're saying to you, I want to know you. Um, I want to feel you. I want to know that you're near to me. I just pray, God, that you would honor that, that you would honor those hearts that are opening their hearts to you this morning. And we know that you are desperate. You say in your scriptures that uh, you stand at the door and you knock and you knock and you knock. There's a longing for someone to open that door. And uh, this morning, Lord, uh, we open that door to you. And uh, we ask, come in. Come and make a place in our hearts. Come and abide with us that we may no longer be alone. We may no longer be empty, but that we can be full and full of life. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Yeah. Amen. 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 We thank Carlos this morning. What I think is so uh, special about a morning like this, where the third song that we sung was great, is His faithfulness. And yet we just hear a story about the faithfulness of God. Even when we're faithless, God is faithful, church. And, uh, you know, often people will ask me when we do interviews like this, Yeah, but there was no preaching of the Word this morning, Jared. You know, there was no preaching. The paradox of a story like that, or the paradox of anyone's story really, is not to glorify someone's past and not even to really glorify the person. The paradox of someone telling their testimony is, look at me, but then look beyond me to the greatness and the glory of my Saviour. And that's why we do my story so far. That's why we love hearing about real life, 
or real people and them discovering a real Saviour is not to glorify the person and not to say how great is Carlos or how great is that person, but it's actually to say as a church, how great is Jesus? That He could take a life like Carlos's and do incredible things through it and now He's influencing the next generation of Carlos's in the spheres that He operates in. Only God could do that. Only God could take the broken pieces of someone's life and restore it to something incredible. Yeah, you can clap. You can give Jesus a hand for that. That's fine. But that's why we do stories like that, is to look at God's great power and to remind you in your seat that what God has done for Carlos, God can do for you. And so it's an encouragement to our faith this morning that God is in the business of restoring. God is in the business of turning lives around. You know what, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you need a breakthrough in your life. It could be anything from an addiction. It could be anything from a relationship breakdown. Friend, I'm here to tell you that God is not finished. God is still alive and God is still working. You believe that this morning? Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? I'm gonna pray and then the team's gonna finish up. Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful for stories like Carlos's. God, it's a boost to our faith. God, it reminds us of how great and how big You are. God, we serve the living God. We serve a God who is not done. And God, we declare and we proclaim for Carlos and his family and his spheres of influence, God, that his best days are ahead of him. And God, let it be a testimony to who You are and what You've done in his life and what You will continue to do. And God, let it all be for us as well. In Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing to praise Jesus right now.